I would encourage you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to be looking at a variety of chapter verses um, this morning. For those of you visiting with us, we're going through a series of sermons entitled, uh, God Meant It For Good. God Meant It For Good. Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. Later on, Joseph was in a position to save them from starving to death. And uh, Joseph told his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Um, if you've gone through a, a time of struggle, trial, um, if you've sought to follow the Lord through that, I think that you will find that it is absolutely true that God does work all things to our good for his glory that we might become more like Christ. And that's what this series of sermons is about. So I'm not doing expository preaching like I would normally do, just go through a book of the Bible and verse by verse. These are more topical of things that God taught me through my journey. So don't judge me if you're, uh, if you're an expository sermon type person. Um, I am too, but I like to do topic, topical every now and then. So Matthew 18 is a good place for us to begin this morning, beginning at verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when, the ser that, when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Months after I was asked to resign from my former position, a YouTube video was recommended to me. The video was on the topic of forgiveness. The speaker, who I don't remember, spoke of a time when he was treated unjustly by a church. He uh, was a pastor. This was in London, I believe, somewhere over there. In this talk that he was giving, he gave several indicators of how we could determine if we had truly forgiven someone. Holly and I were watching the video together in our living room on the television. And at the end, he gave an invitation for people to stand. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm watching something on TV or even on a video, if we have it in a, in a class, I feel a little weird clapping my hands along with whatever they're doing or standing up if they ask you to stand. You know, we just sort of chill out and don't, just let it happen there. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. When he said, if any of you need to forgive, just stand up right now. I stood up, and so did Holly. 
And the tears were just flowing down my cheeks. And I asked God to help me to forgive. Help me forgive. I had the sincerest desire to forgive. But to be honest, I had a lot of questions about forgiveness. I had never felt the intensity of the sting of being wronged as I felt it at this point in my life. Never before had I had a situation that caused me to struggle so much with forgiving someone. And it scared me. I had questions about what, it, what did it mean for me to forgive those who wronged me? Was I supposed to confront them, as Matthew 18 says? Or had I already done that? And the ball was now in their court? How was I supposed to react to them if I saw them in public? Do I ignore them? Do I slip down the other aisle and pretend I didn't see them? Do I confront them? Or do I just simply greet them and pretend that nothing ever happened? What does it mean? What does it look like daily for me to forgive them? I didn't question at all my need to forgive. I knew that. Scripture is very clear, as we've just read. Forgiveness on our part is crucial, essential, necessary to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Jesus said, If you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you. Those are strong words. And I wasn't feeling much forgiveness. So I was scared. Scared. God has forgiven us, forgiven us of more than we can ever imagine. Our debt to him is something that we can never repay. But he still showed us mercy. He extended his grace to all of us who have received him. And he forgave us. And Jesus tells us we are to do the same. No one owes God more than we owe God. No one owes me more than I owe God. God has forgiven us. He has removed our debt so there's no more condemnation towards us, as Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says. And our forgiveness is to be the same, no condemnation. A complete removal of debt, nothing hanging over the person's head. And i got to tell you, that's not easy to do. In fact, I would, I would encourage you to realize it's impossible without the Holy Spirit working in your life. Forgiveness is difficult. And I think it's difficult because it always costs the person who's forgiving. It seldom costs the person who's being forgiven. But if you are the one granting forgiveness, it costs you. Various situations, it will cost you something different, but it's nearly always painful. In order for our Heavenly Father to forgive us, it cost Him the death of His Son. In order for us to, give, to forgive someone, most of the time we have to give up something. We may give up our pride. We may give up the right to be right. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's painful most of the time. When we're talking about forgiveness, we need to realize that we cannot earn God's forgiveness. You can't earn his forgiveness. And we must not make that a stipulation of those that we forgive. They can never earn our forgiveness. And we should not wait till we think they've done enough for them to earn it. The only thing required on the part of the one who has sinned to receive forgiveness is confession. 
Forgiveness is given when confession is made. We'll go to that a little later on. Forgiveness means that the, the justified punishment is canceled. It's justified, but it's removed. It's canceled. Now, that doesn't mean that legal and natural consequences don't continue to play out, because they, they do. But in the spiritual realm, in our dealings with other people, whatever punishment uh, or justice we may have wanted to see, we must let go of it. No longer seek to inflict any kind of justice. That's one of the painful things to do. When you forgive, justice goes out the window. And we are a nation about justice, are we not? Amen. Forgiveness has nothing to do with your emotions either. It's not something that we do when we feel like it. If we waited till we felt like it, we never would do it. Although there may be a time of healing in your life where to sincerely forgive someone, you, you need that time to heal and work through things. But it has nothing to do with your emotions. It is a command of God. Whether we feel like it or not, it is something that we must give to those who sin against us and confess. Jesus had an interesting encounter that he used to teach on this subject of mercy and forgiveness. It's found in Luke chapter 7, verse 36 and following. If, if you want to turn there, you can turn there. But remember, Jesus had gone to Simon, the Pharisee's house, and was having dinner. And uh, sometime during that meal, a woman came in who was known to be a prostitute. And she wet Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped Jesus' feet with her hair and then poured perfume on his feet. And Simon the Pharisee, you know, the, the good church-going religious guy, he said, man, if he knew who she was, he wouldn't be letting her do that. And Jesus said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. How, uh, now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he tore, tore, turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. What was the point that Jesus was making here? Well, we could say that when, when we go through a situation where we need other people or someone to give us understanding and compassion and even forgiveness, most normal people going through that situation will be more apt to give to other people understanding and compassion. And forgiveness. It causes us to do that. But that's not the point, I don't believe. This woman understood the enormity of her sin against God. But the Pharisee thought he was doing rather well. He didn't have much sin. Therefore, he didn't need a lot of forgiveness. He just needed a little bit of forgiveness, a little bit of mercy, a little bit of compassion. But Jesus' point was, when we come to grips with the enormity of our own sin, we too will love as this woman loved. The prodigal son basically teaches the same point. When the younger son returned and was received back into the family as if he never left, the older son was indignant. 
You need to know that Jesus was teaching this parable to the religious leaders, people like Simon the Pharisee. Jesus' point was to them, you are the older son, thinking you have done everything right, you've stayed here, you've worked for me, you have earned my love. You don't need any grace, and you don't need any forgiveness. Can I tell you that when we're not willing to forgive, it means we do not understand our own sin. When we're not willing to forgive, we don't understand our own sin. And therefore, our confession of sin and our sense of our need for God's grace are very, very limited. I'm going to say this comment, and I think... I don't know if it's true, but it is a thought that I think we all should think. You see, Jesus said, if we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. Could it be, could it be that our refusal to forgive simply indicates we've never been saved? Because if I'm truly saved, I do understand the enormity of my sin, do I not? I realize how much God has forgiven me. How could I not forgive if I understand that? Again, I don't know that that's true. But I would say that it's something we all need to ponder. But again, my issue was not with the need to forgive. I knew I must forgive. My struggle was with the application of my forgiveness. The actual doing of it. What did it mean to forgive my staff for lying about me? What did it mean for those who believed a sexual predator's lies? and yet pretty much condemned me. What does it mean or look like, especially since in most cases confession never took place? When we say we must forgive as God has forgiven us, I would ask the question, does God's forgiveness happen without confession? Now, let me tell you, be careful how you answer that, because if you say yes, then every single person on the face of this earth is going to be forgiven. That's the only conclusion you can come to. Because if you don't have to ask confession, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for all sin on the cross, right? And if I don't have to confess, I'm good to go. That doesn't, that, it doesn't matter whether you believe in limited atonement or not, or whether you believe in, in uh, uh, God wants everybody to be saved. That's the only thing I can think of right now. It doesn't matter. If there's no need for confession, then everyone is already forgiven. But I would propose to you that confession is necessary. Are there times... Are there situations where forgiveness is not given? How do we treat those who've sinned against us and they have not confessed? I searched the scriptures long and hard, and I, I came to the conclusion that it's not as black and white as mo pe most people will tell you. Oh, just forgive them. It's not that black and white. So I want us to do a little bit of Bible study. Forgive me if we're late. We will be late. We definitely will be late. Matthew 18, Jesus. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? 
Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven, but 77. Jesus said the same thing over in Luke chapter 17. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. The parable of the unmerciful servant is, uh, follows this passage that I just read to you in Matthew 18. It is Jesus' extension on his teaching of how many times and how much should we forgive. God's forgiveness to us is unlimited, and our forgiveness towards others should be unlimited. But, notice, Jesus' teaching says that confession or repentance precedes forgiveness. Now, some of you may not agree with me, but I'm telling you what I feel like God's Word says. It would appear that an acknowledgement of sin is necessary for forgiveness to be applied to your life. Jesus actually said, if he refuses to listen to the church, if, if he refuses to listen to them, the, the two or three that went with them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Titus says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. Boy, do you know how many church splits we could have counteracted if people had done this? You want to be divisive? There's the door. Paul in 1 Corinthians, I've written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside, expel the wicked man from among you. So, the one who refuses to listen when he has sinned, when the church confronts them and holds them accountable, and they refuse to confess, are they forgiven? No, they are not forgiven. They are expelled from the body of Christ. We're told to treat them as tax collectors. We're told to have nothing to do with them, not even eat with them. Confession is necessary. When someone confesses, we are to forgive, and we are to forgive as Jesus forgave. No strings attached, unlimited, full, no more justice required. Even if they come to us with the same offense seven times in one day. I mean, I love Holly, and I've been with her for 40 years, and I don't think she's offended me seven times in one day ever. Who? Who would ever offend us that many times in one day with the same offense? There's no seven limit here. It doesn't matter how many times they are a repeat offender. If they come to us and ask our forgiveness, yes, it's given. How many times have you gone to God with the same sin? I find it interesting to ask, when did God forgive you? When did God forgive you? When did God apply forgiveness to your life? That's an interesting question, don't you think? John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'll give you another couple of verses in a little while that goes along with that. So, 
somebody's going to say, okay, pastor, but what would you do with Jesus? Because he said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Or Luke 22, I mean, uh, Mark eleven twenty five, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. That sounds like I can forgive somebody without them ever confessing to me, right? And realize that this morning as you are sitting here, you are in the position of when you stand praying. You're here. You're offering sacrifice to the Lord. I believe both of these passages of Scripture have to do with the heart. Just think for a minute. Do you really believe that everyone who crucified Christ or had anything to do with his crucifixion was forgiven by God? When Jesus said, Lord, forgive them, they know not what they do. I don't know anybody who would make that claim. Instead, we should realize that Jesus' heart of forgiveness was flowing from his mouth. He longed for those who crucified him to come to a place where they knew that he hung on that tree for them and received forgiveness of their sins when they come to that point. And the same is true, I believe, of, of Mark chapter 11. It's a matter of our heart. Whether or not a person confesses to us or not, and this is very important, whether or not a person who has offended you or sinned against you confesses or not, we, we must have a heart of forgiveness. I cannot hold a grudge. We must let it go. Now, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. We simply leave it in God's hand to deal with the person. But our heart and our soul must be settled to the point that when confession comes, we will happily forgive and rejoice in the opportunity to forgive. We cannot allow bitterness or anger to grow within us. Ephesians says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling, slander, along with every other form of malice. Make every effort to live in peace. We should desire that person's good. The one who has not confessed, we should desire their good. And the best good that can happen is for them to come to the place of confession and repentance. We wish them no harm. We're not happy when bad things happen to them. We should sincerely love them and seek their good, but if they've not confessed, we should never treat them as though nothing ever happened. If there's sin in their life that we're helping them cover up, that's not good. They need to confess that. I also believe that Jesus' uh, teaching on loving our enemies is, is applicable here. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are, you not, e uh, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? My opinion is pretty clear to me. He's not talking about Christians here. He's talking about those who persecute Christians. He's talking about those who are not brothers. So... How should we treat those who have sinned against us who do not know the Lord? Well, you don't go to them and say, listen, you've got to confess. We don't go to them and confront them with it. I mean, if you want to restore a relationship with them, you, you need to talk to them. But we should never expect them to confess. It's not in their heart to do so. And we should love them anyway. And even though it doesn't speak to Christians, Christians are not excluded in this because, let's be frank, <laughs> sometimes Christians become your enemy. We are to have an attitude of love towards them. An attitude of love, no matter what, whether they confess or they don't. Again, that doesn't mean we excuse their sin. 
It means we pray for them. We seek ways to love them without giving the impression that the offense against us never happened. In Romans chapter 12, Paul said, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We're supposed to be doing good toward those who have offended us and sinned against us, even if there's no confession. That's not easy. Just this week, I'm driving down the road, and there's someone who was part of all this. And I said, oh. Looked like, looked like they had car trouble or something, and the car wasn't there, so they were just having to walk. My first inclination was, just keep going, Tim. Just keep going. And I said, no. No, Lord. I know that's not what you want me to do. So I stopped. I said, hey, you need a ride? Sure. They got in, took them home. They said, thank you. Still no confession. But that's what God would want me to do, to seek ways of doing good for them. Another important truth I want you to know is this. There is a vast amount of difference between having a heart of forgiveness and reconciliation. There's a vast amount of difference between a heart of forgiveness and reconciliation. Uh, without reading through it all, because we are late, in, in, um, in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about God reconciling the world to himself through Christ Jesus. In other words, on the cross, Jesus accomplished everything necessary for God to, to no longer have any hurdles to jump over to love anyone. All sin. All sin. There's no person. There's no person that God would have issues with. His heart toward them was now free to love and forgive. Okay? When Christ died on the cross. But later on down, Paul says, we've been given this ministry of reconciliation. Be reconciled to God. You see, God reconciled himself to mankind when Christ died on the cross. He did everything necessary for us to, to have salvation, for him to give us salvation. But we must come to him. We must confess. We must reconcile ourselves to him. Reconciliation is two people, not one. I can have a heart of forgiveness towards someone, but if they haven't confessed, there will never be reconciliation of the relationship. Never. It won't happen. I mean, it can. But you're not wrong in not doing it, is the point I would make. In our hearts, we must remove anything that would prevent us from forgiving someone. You hear me? Whether they confess or not, in your heart, you must ask God to remove anything that prevents you from forgiving them. So that when that day comes and they confess, you should freely give forgiveness and be reconciled. That's a lot to go through, I know. But let me, let me just summarize it with a few points. Whenever anyone sins against us, we have to clean out our heart. We have to develop a heart of forgiveness. Don't allow the bitterness, the resentment, and the thoughts of revenge to be there. We must settle it within us. Turn it over to God. Allow Him to do His work, even if they never confess. And when a do person does confess, I don't care what they've done. I don't. It doesn't matter what they've done. If they confess to you, we must forgive. If a person never forgets, confesses, we must still have that heart of forgiveness. 
and we should seek their good and pray for them, and we should never, but we should never treat them as though the sin never occurred. And can I tell you that sin is a killer of churches? And it must be dealt with. Unfortunately, sin has not been dealt with in churches. If someone commits an egregious sin and they just are bragging about it and there's no, there's no sense of remorse or confession on their part, then they should be removed from the church having gone through the proper steps. If a Christian is living in open sin, they should be confronted, given ample opportunity to confess and repent. If they do, wonderful, done. Love them, forgive them, receive them just as they are, reconcile. But if they refuse, they should be removed from the church and treated as a sinner needing the Lord. My prayer this morning is that there's not a person here, not one person here, who is harboring bitterness or resentment towards anyone because of any sin committed against you. To have that bitterness and that resentment towards another is like swallowing poison and hoping they die. You swallowing the poison, hoping they die, is doing nothing but killing you. And you may not know it, it's destroying your relationship with your Heavenly Father. I believe I reached a place in my heart where I was willing to rejoice and forgive when confession happened. In fact, I've had one person come to me and say, I was wrong. I was wrong. And I hugged them and I forgave them and our, our relationship is what it used to be. I wish I could say that resentment and bitterness res never raises its head in my heart. <laughs> oh, there are days I struggle with it. There are days where I just want to say, sick them, Lord. But you know that's wrong. Forgiveness isn't something that you do once and you're done with it. It's a constant battle. It's a daily decision. I have to bring myself there every day. If there's someone in your life this morning that you are refusing to have a heart of forgiveness towards, I beg you, I beg you, let it go today. Give it to the Lord. Turn it over to him. I exhort you to realize the enormity of your sin that God, through the wonderful grace of Jesus, extended to you. And I encourage you to do the same toward others, those who have sinned against you. Whether they've confessed to you or not, you must have a heart of forgiveness toward them. Remember this. John said, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. Amen.